good afternoon to all of you and uh, i personally extend a very warm welcome to my three eminent panelists uh, who are sitting with me at the dais uh, i can't think of any other occasion when uh, an organizer organizers of any conference have been able to collect together such sparkling uh, intellectuals wow. from the field of yes wow <laughs> wow i must say wow yes uh, such a sparkling collection of intellectuals, scholars, critics, and people who have open-mindedly crossed borders and met each other at a highly argumentative intellectual plane, but a very, very friendly extending of hands. This is what I see between us, and I thank you all for joining us today. And I think this is a feast that young scholars should partake of most heartily, because this is not always that it so happens that a uh, Siddhi Khali and a uh, Mujibuddin and a uh, Tutun Mukherjee can share a platform and share their views in front of you. So I welcome you all for a very fine feast. Uh, the topic for today is uh, a very suitable topic. Yesterday we had a very, very fruitful session on translation. And today we have invited our panelists to discuss uh, and, and express their views on multiculturalism and literature and the, if you notice the wording that your organizers have made for you, literature appropriates almost everything <laughs> to tone, I must say that to you. And uh, we have said that multiculturalism is at the heart of literature, and we almost are saying perhaps that neither uh, conversation on multiculturalism can take place without literature as its mainstay, nor can perhaps literature in the present age hope without talking of the multi multicultural trends that are available. So in this sense of a dialogue, we would like the discussion to begin. And I must uh, tell you one more thing. Uh, I have slightly changed the order of the uh, presentation. I personally think, and I think Tutun will agree with me, that uh, Tutun uh, should be, and I think will be, if she agrees, to be the last speaker yes. uh, on the panel, in the sense that, uh, Literature will talk first of how it holds itself in today's globalization, today's multiculturalism, today's area of diversity. Because if I don't call it multiculturalism, I, the only other word I think of is diversity. And you, literature has always boasted of diversity, uh, of, uh, of inclusiveness, diversity of languages, diversity of genres, diversity of approaches. So I think this is how I see it. That Literature presents its case first, and then the comparatist will come forward and speak of how those things can compare themselves together, how can, how can they be brought under the area, under the umbrella of comparativism, and then, of course, that is true multiculturality, as I see it. I am trying to put it forward in very, very uh, simple terms, in the sense that I leave it to the scholars to deal with it through theory, through the practical examples. But one thing I will say again, that if there is any way of studying world literature, it is by studying the world languages, it is by studying the uh, world, the societies, the different societies, the ethnographies, the ethnic presences today available. And uh, the only thing that a literature teacher or a scholar can say is that the day the literature teacher and the scholar presents the true picture of what we call world literature, that day is a day when I think the different controversial combinations that we see in these ethnic presences, the conflicts that we are afraid we are noticing rather too much and too insistently, those can be overcome only through, I think, through literature. I do not know if we give our uh, area of study that kind of a master, masterly and a, a controlling uh, capacity, but I see no other way except literature as the joining force as the reaching out of hands, reaching out of in a friendly manner, reaching out across borders, reaching out across differences, those borders which have been created. And I'm afraid in India we are doing it rather too much today with the different literatures insistently pushing themselves forward as the only voice. If these voices have to be told that yes, you can exist, but if you can, you can coexist, that would be better. If I can uh, invite my panelists to speak of, at the end of their presentations, to speak of how 
uh, what I am saying may be possible, I think we'll be having a uh, very meaningful in closure to what we are saying. May I first uh, request Professor Siddiq Ali to come forward with his views? And let me tell my young audience here that at the end of uh, each panelist and his talk, uh, we could have had a discussion. But as I see it, sir, shall we have it like that? At the yeah, end of each you. panelist or at the close? Yes, at the end of each panelist, we could have had uh, the usual kind of a discussion. But I think let us listen to all the panelists together and then we throw the house open for discussion. And uh, the young people, I advise them to have their questions ready. Please make some notes so that at the end of the whole session, we have very few, very pointed, pithy, and uh, direct, direct and uh, very meaningful questions asked and answers. Is that all right? Yes, sir. Professor Siddhartha, would you like to speak from here? Good afternoon. Let me first congratulate all of you for being present this afternoon at this very late hour, despite all the problems and the turmoil in the city. You know, this is a very, very, very healthy and a very good sign for the university and also for the Department of English who have so very ably organized this conference. I must have a word of praise for my colleagues from the Department of English, starting with Professor Amina Kishore, Professor Haseeb Adin, and Dr. Shugupta Shaheen for doing an excellent job. Uh, I have been invited to talk briefly about comparative literature with its implicit comparativism at the heart of multiculturalism. I don't know whether I am qualified to speak on this subject because I am not a specialist in comparative literature. My only claim to be a comparatist is uh, in the form of a Fulbright project, project which I carried out, you know, late in the uh, late 90s, 98, 99, that was on a comparative uh, study of Concordian transcendentalists and the Sufi poets, particularly the Persian <coughs> poets. And besides that, the only thing which I have done is supervised, you know, Shugufta's thesis, uh, which was released yesterday in the form of a book. I'm not going to deliberate a lot on these concepts, and particularly so, I'm very diffident in the presence of my friend, Dr. Tutun Mukherjee, who is, who is a specialist in this area as such. Nonetheless, I would like to raise certain questions and let us all try at the end to find some answers to these questions. Uh, <clears throat> Let me first begin by making a reference to the most influential, you know, literary theorist about whom yesterday Professor Amina Kishore also spoke, Gayatri Spivak. You know, the, the title of her 2003 publication is The Death of a Discipline. The title is, in fact, you know, a collection of a series of lectures delivered by her at Columbia University. The title is suggestive of the fact that comparative literature is dead. Is it so? That is the question we have to address. In fact, all students of literature know very well that right from the 1920s, critics have been talking about the death of the novel. Later on, and these pronouncements, you know, became louder and louder in the 1950s and 60s. Then we also had this startling, you know, announcement made by Ronald Bass about the death of the author. But as we have noticed, the novels continue to be written. The authors 
are healthy and alive and writing. <coughs> so when these people talked about the death, what they were talking about, in fact, is you know the decline, the decline. In this context, you know, I am reminded of an excellent essay written by John Barth, again in the 60s, I think it was 1967. It's called as the literature of exhaustion. Some of you must be familiar with that. In that, he said that all forms of literature are exhausted. Then what do we do? The only possible remedy for this is to reinvent and rework these forms. And of course, he suggested that parody is perhaps an alternate you know, mode which can be used to re reinvent and rework you know, the older forms as such. And <clears throat> so, you know, uh, this is very much true for the comparative literature uh, studies today. The two-day conference organized uh, by the Department of English, Manu, in fact, is also <laughs> an exercise in finding out new directions in comparative literature. This need to rethink comparative literature arises from the confusion created by a variety of items linked to comparative, uh, sorry, variety of terms linked to comparative literature. Terms like world literature, diasporic studies, post-colonial literature, area studies, diversity studies are some of the terms which are very often discussed in any engagement with comparative literature. Whatever are the terms used to define or describe the discipline, it is intrinsically linked to culture. Today, it is being increasingly studied under the rubric of culture studies. Most often than not, multiculturalism is the framework under which this discipline is debated in the world, which is now today, or in contemporary times, described as a global village, as such. Before I proceed further, let us pause for a moment and ask another question which was also suggested and hinted at the inaugural function yesterday. It's a very important question. Is multiculturalism dead? I'm sure you have understood what I am saying. This is a reference which was made yesterday also. Uh, if you look at, it seems <coughs> so, if you go by the views expressed by Cameron, the British Prime Minister, Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, and Nicolas Sarkozy of France. All the three European leaders have declared in no uncertain terms that multiculturalism has failed in Europe. We are fortunate, and we have been assured by the US Consul General yesterday that multiculturalism is alive in the US and, you know, there may be some reservations in certain sections, but you know, the people at large you know, in the US welcome you know, the multicultural. You know, she talked extensively about the melting pot theory and the salad bowl you know, uh, <coughs> theories as such. Now, that's another subject for study, American multicultural, multiculturalism. I'm not going to get into that now. You know, these European leaders think that multiculturalism, you know, encourages separatism and has failed to integrate the immigrants into the European culture. I am not going into the merits or demerits of this argument at this point. However, it's clear that the root of the problem, according to them, is the reluctance of the immigrants in accepting the cultural practices and values of the European society. 
as such. These views make us wonder what exactly is meant by multiculturalism. We have to seriously think about the whole concept and idea of multiculturalism. Does it mean total assimilation into the mainstream culture? Or what are the limits to diversity? Multiculturalism is not merely the presence of many cultures in any society or presence of many cultural stands, but a meaningful, positive, productive relationship between the different veins of culture. It necessarily encompasses plurality and diversity as such. Now, after having briefly said this, in terms of studies, literary studies as well. Ever since the publication of the book, Comparative Literature in the Age of Multiculturalism in 1995, a lot of debate has taken place about the scope and future of comparative literature. Those who are into comparative literature field know very well that, culti that in the past, comparative literature was an established canon of European masterpieces. 